A review on the novel Sweetness and Power, The Place of Sugar in Modern History by Professor Sidney Mintz. To refrain from eating sugar in modern society takes both vigilance and effort. Sugar features as an ingredient in many products found on our supermarket shelves and consumed as a part of our daily diets. Our consumption of sugar suggests that humans have an innate liking for sweetness, a natural sweet tooth. But anthropologist Sidney Mintz argues that the story isn't that simple. He believes that sugar-eating habits are culturally conventionalised norms resulting from our capacity to endow the material world with symbolic meaning. Mintz takes readers on a detailed journey through sugar's history to see how England was transformed into a sugar-craving nation. For this review, I will focus on sugar's transition from a rarity to a luxury and eventually to a virtual necessity by 1850, to explore why Mintz believes the reasons behind our consumption of sugar extend beyond our taste buds. Christopher Columbus first carried sugar to the newly discovered Americas from the Canary Islands in 1493. It wasn't until 1544 that England began to refine the sugar she was producing. But after 1585, London was considered the most important refining centre for the European trade. In Mexico and Paraguay, along the Pacific coast of South America and in fertile valleys everywhere, sugarcane prospered. Early 16th century enslaved Africans were being imported to power the sugar industry. And within only a century, the French and even more the British with the help of the Dutch from the outset, became the Western world's greatest sugar makers and exporters. The 17th century was a time of rapid urbanisation throughout England, and consequently there was a greater dependence on the market for items of daily living. A major turning point for British sugar production was the settlement of Barbados in 1627. From there, the British sugar industry expanded rapidly to Jamaica. Two triangles of trade arose in the 17th century. In the first, finished goods were sold to Africa, African slaves to the Americas, and American tropical commodities to England. In the second, rum from New England went to Africa, African slaves to the West Indies, and molasses back to New England to make rum. These triangles brought divergent economic interests into confrontation, but undoubtedly the greatest impact was the unethical treatment of millions of humans as commodities. Sugar, or rather the great commodity market which arose demanding it, has been one of the massive demographic forces in world history. Because of it, literally millions of enslaved Africans reached the new world. The use of slavery was perhaps the single biggest external contribution to Europe's economic growth. Of all the countries vying for the Americas, England fought the most, conquered the most colonies, imported the most slaves, and went furthest and fastest in creating plantation systems, the most important product of which was sugar. Three harshly bitter tropical stimulants were introduced into England in the late 17th century, each considered more palatable when made into a hot drink and combined with sugar. Tea turned out to be more economical than coffee and chocolate, with its production one of the most lucrative sources of private wealth and government tax returns in the British Empire. The success of tea added to the success of sugar, with the two becoming inseparable companions. So cheap were tea and sugar that they were considered the irreducible minimum below which was only starvation. It is indeed a very strange thing that common people were obliged to use, as part of their daily diets, two articles imported from opposite sides of the earth. But nevertheless, both sugar and tea came to define English character. From 1700 to 1809, there was an estimated 400% increase in annual per capita sugar consumption, from 1.8 kilograms to 8.2 kilograms. The Industrial Revolution and the introduction of women into the workforce radically changed the eating habits of the nation, with new foods and beverages incorporated into daily life with unusual rapidity, sugar having an important role in nearly all of them. 
The economic appeal of sugar as a food solution is almost irresistible. Sugar cane produces larger quantities of utilizable calories per land unit in a given time than any other cultivated plant in respective climatic zones. An acre of sugar cane will produce more than 8 million calories. To produce 8 million calories from other crops, you would need more than 4 acres of potatoes, between 9 to 12 acres of wheat, or a massive 135 acres to raise 8 million calories of beef. Sugar containing convenience foods freed the wage earning wife from meal preparation whilst providing large numbers of calories to the family. Sugar was consumed in tea, but also in biscuits, tarts, buns, candy and pastries. Afternoon tea, initially a habit of the royals, became commonplace and sugar was abundant in almost all the morsels on offer. England's rising middle class developed hundreds of variations of pudding, with even the plainest dinner served above the poverty line, incomplete without one. Sugar-laded custard was a common accompaniment. Fruit preserves containing 50 to 65% of their weight in sugar were mastered, and the urban working class consumed much of their fruit in the form of jam. New occasions for sugar consumption were forged and consolidated particular meanings. These would deepen sugar's everyday quality, making it more homey and endowed with ritual meaning specific to the social and cultural position of those who used it. But the meanings of food also related to the will and intent of England's rulers. Those who controlled society held a commanding position to sugar's availability and some of the meanings sugar products acquired. The taxability of sugar meant that there were powerful vested interests in its continued and expanded consumption. Sugar consumption by the powerful mattered less. Sugar acquired importance because the masses of English people were steadily consuming more of it and desiring more of it than they could afford. Producing, shipping, refining and taxing sugar for consumption by the commoners had become significantly profitable. Sugar consumption enabled the expansion of the British Empire. Commoners ate it because it was affordable, calorie dense and a versatile ingredient, until eventually sugar had symbolised itself as a part of our daily lives. Despite being aware of the negative health effects of sugar consumption, we continue to eat it. As a habit with our coffee or tea, as a spread on our toast, to provide us with a boost of energy at mid-afternoon or to complete our evening meal. Like mints, I believe that this is in part due to habits, associations and the need for convenience. It is unlikely that modern society will revert back to the eating habits of pre-sugar England, with meals taken at home and produced from local ingredients. Today, the public health battle with sugar is waged in an arena covered in the advertisements of sugar-dense foods. Decisions about health come down to individual choices, but those choices are made in a society that is still predominantly encouraging us to consume sugar. Do you agree? Are you swayed by advertising? Are there ways in which you have eaten sugar in your diets from a young age? Is it a constant decision or a continued habit? Do you know how much sugar is in the foods you buy and eat? And does this knowledge affect the goods you choose to purchase?